My name is Bert Jacobs. I was born in Oldenburg, Germany in 1934, uh, January the 23rd. I was four years of age in 1938 when my parents moved or fled from Germany to Holland to a safer haven and when we crossed the border at night uh, we were searched by German soldiers. They looked like they were eight feet tall with their great trench coats and their helmets. That was my first recollection of uh, German soldiers or Nazis. When the Germans <coughs> invaded Holland, that was in May of 1940, uh, we all had to wear a star to be identified as Jews. This was the star that all the Jews had to wear in order to identify themselves. And uh, the only people in Holland that really respected us were the clergy. They would take their head off and they would bow to us. Uh, the children would not play with us. They were, they were told that the Jews were, were dirt. Whenever we walked on the sidewalk and German soldiers uh, would come by, we would have to get off the sidewalk and uh, more or less uh, kowtow to them and wait till they are passed, till we could get back on the sidewalk. Well, we were prohibited to go back to school, to go to parks, to go to movies. We were not allowed to uh, travel from one city to the next because we had to get a permit. Uh, my father lost his car, then he lost his bicycle, then we lost the radio, and then he was not able to uh, perform his profession anymore. This is the sign that we saw on all the shops that we were not allowed to go into, like movie theaters, uh, parks, uh, anything that had anything to do with uh, public places, we were not, it, it says, Jews are not allowed to enter. The time progressed to 1942, and he felt that we, should get a hiding place, and in August of 1942, we then uh, found a hiding, he found a hiding place at a farm in uh, near Nijmegen, it's called Beek, B-E-E-K, and uh, we went down there on, in August of 1942. Why were we ostracized? Just because we're Jews, uh, we were not allowed to be with uh, anybody that was our age. Uh, what were they planning to do with us? And uh, we felt very isolated and uh, some of my dad's uh, friends, uh, they went to so-called labor camps in order to uh, have their family to be saved. And my dad said, no, I will not go because that is a uh, way for the Germans to get a, the head of the families away from the, uh, from the family and make them leaderless. And he said, we are going to go. He never told us what he was planning to do, but I know my parents took a lot of trips to the place that we were going to hide and uh, they brought clothes there and, and uh, blankets and things like that that we could use. Before we went to the farm, we, uh, this Dutch policeman told my dad that he was going to be picked up the next day to be, uh, or he had to report to the train station because his uh, number for the labor camp was up and he should get out of town. So my sister 
and my, uh, my mother left that same day by train and uh, my dad and I left the next morning at six o'clock in the morning and we went to the train station and we had our identity uh, hidden. We did not wear the so-called hated yellow star with the word Jew in it or Yod, like they said in Holland. And we were waiting for the train to go from uh, our, to our hiding place. And on the other side, we saw long rows of uh, Jewish men with their suitcases waiting for a train to go to the deportation camps or the so-called labor camps, which weren't labor camps at all. <coughs> so my dad and I, we got into the train and we went to uh, from uh, Den Bos to Nijmegen and when we walked out of the train uh, we had to walk uh, to a streetcar and the streetcar in Nijmegen took us to a park. The park itself had a big sign on it, no Jews are allowed in this park. <coughs> And so my dad said to me, let's go take a walk in the park because we don't want to stand here waiting for another streetcar to come by that would be suspicious. I said, we can't go in. We're Jews. He said, you are not a Jew today. You took your sign off and therefore just listen to me and do whatever I tell you. So we walked through the park I remember that very clearly. And then we took the next streetcar to the place that would bring us close to the hiding place. Um, the hiding, the streetcar stopped on top of a hill and the farm that we were going to go and hide was in the middle of the hill. And uh, it was a nice warm summer day. And he said, when we get to that farm, We'll have a glass of milk. Well, the glass of milk lasted 25 months because we never came outside. And uh, when we were at the farm, they showed us where we had to hide. <coughs> we had to go through the barn, climb up a rickety ladder, uh, climb over the hay, and there was a little trap door uh, underneath the hay that we had to crawl through that would give us access to our hiding place. And my sister and my mother were there already. And uh, that was August uh, the 27th of 1942. Uh, the family that hit us, their name was Dreesen and um, my dad had made an agreement with them that they would get all the cattle that he had and that he uh, would pay them a certain amount of money every month in order to keep us. And they didn't know how long we were going to stay. They figured maybe three, four months at the most, and the three, four months turned out to be 25 months. And uh, the people that lived in the house were two families, uh, the older uh, Dreesen and their son, and on the other side of the house lived their daughter who just got married and uh, was pregnant. And uh, they, they more or less, they tolerated us. The only one that really was very, very wonderful to us was the daughter. She protected us. Her husband wanted to get rid of us. He said, we don't want any Jews here. And, uh, we're in great danger. If they catch us, then uh, we're going to go to a camp too or be, are going to be executed. The older person, Dreesen, um, in our daily activities, which were very minimal, he would uh, have me come down and we would play checkers. I played 
25 months with this man about two, three times a week. And my dad told me, he said, you are not allowed to win one game because our life is at stake and this older man might turn against us. And he said, you are not allowed to show him that you lose by purpose. So this was a great test for me. Sometimes uh, I would go downstairs and look at the spider webs in the, uh, in the barn. The, the toilet was there too, which was just a, a plain cut uh, hole in a piece of wood. We had, uh, as toilet paper, we had used newspaper, which was not too good. Uh, our daily activities were uh, very limited. Uh, my sister tried to teach me uh, the element, uh, elementary things about uh, arithmetic and reading and writing because I only had part of first grade when the Germans forbid uh, Jews to go to school. So she taught me to read and to write and uh, we kept busy. We made uh, our own Monopoly game. Uh, I uh, unraveled potato bags and uh, my sister uh, would knit uh, shoes and handbags from that. And eventually my other sister, because we were with four siblings, joined us because she had to leave the place where she was in hiding. And my brother was hidden in another place again. We were all spread apart. And uh, when my other sister joined us after uh, about a year, uh, they were both very, kept very busy uh, writing their diaries and um, both girls finished their diaries uh, close to the last day that we were in hiding. And uh, the one sister's diary was published about uh, two years ago, after 50 years. And uh, it made uh, the headlines in Holland. It was the only diary that was published uh, beside Anne Frank's. And I just went to Holland in October and uh, just as put that in and uh, they had a large exposition in uh, a museum near Nijmegen and uh, I have pictures of that to show you. My older sister Rose. And what happened to her? She was killed uh, by a German fragmentation bomb on October 2nd, 1944, and she kept a diary, and uh, all during the war, and uh, it was a diary that was hope, despair, and two days before she finished her diary, which was uh, on September the 14th or 15th, she wrote, I hope that a bomb will kill us. When uh, there are people visiting downstairs, you could not move, you could not cough, you could not sneeze, you could not go to the bathroom. And these people had visitors and they didn't, they should not know that we were hiding there. So we had to stay like a mouse, that quiet. Talking about mice, we slept on straw and at night, uh, once in a while, I could hear my dad with his slipper hitting a mouse, uh, and uh, that was not too pleasant. We did not have heat. We did not have, uh, it was cold in the winter. It was warm in the summer, and we had to put up with it. Our, uh, we did not have water to wash ourselves. Just a little bowl, uh, but never a shower, never a bath. We didn't have any toothpaste. We didn't have any toothbrushes. Uh, 
We had hardly soap. Soap was very sparse in Holland. Uh, we did not have any uh, food coupons because my dad did not want anybody to know that uh, we were hiding there. He could have gotten that from the Dutch underground, but by telling somebody that we were in hiding, uh, if somebody from the Dutch underground is going to be picked up, they might talk and we would lose our lives. So he kept everything very, very secret. And there was only one man that would come down there every four weeks. And it was my dad's friend. Uh, he was, of course, not Jewish. His name was Jan John Cruz. And he brought, every month, he brought my dad money so we could pay the farmer uh, because he did not keep us for free. Uh, about food, we had uh, oatmeal with water every morning. We had potatoes in the afternoon and uh, with onions, and that was it. We never had any meat. We saw once, yes, uh, I should say, we not never any meat. We once had a, a small piece of meat, which was about two by two inches and one inch thick. And uh, it smelled great the first day because they, they made it for us downstairs. And uh, the second day we each had a little bite of it. Uh, we never got any butter. Uh, we were on a farm, so we had plenty of potatoes, plenty of onions, and plenty of oatmeal. And when it came to oatmeal, I would not touch oatmeal for the next 50 years. Now I'm eating it again. You know, these things that you uh, never will touch again, and then once again, uh, when you get back into the normal life, uh, things do change. Um, my mother was a very wonderful woman, but she did not have the strength of my dad. She was much more pessimistic, and uh, she had a hard time. And my sisters, uh, they were very, very wonderful. They, my dad kept on feeding them hope and optimism, and that kept them going. And uh, I just followed the rules. I don't know if I could do it again, you know, being uh, cooped up for 25 months. But that's, it's a different story. The worst thing that happened to us were uh, occasions when uh, the German Gestapo uh, would hold a, a search uh, through the house and try to find out if there were Jews hidden in that house. And three times uh, the house was searched. And three times they did not find us um, because of the, the hidden uh, door under the hay, they didn't look that far, and uh, on the side of the house it looked very, very normal, like there was uh, nobody lived there. And the other occasion was when uh, every night we could hear the Allied planes come over on their way to Germany, which was music in our ears, and we could hear the difference in the tone of the engines, they were very monotonous. And the German planes, they, they, you could hear them on and on and off. So uh, a couple of times, uh, the German anti-aircraft would uh, shoot one of those planes down. And uh, I remember one night, uh, we could hear a loud, uh, like a siren coming closer and closer and it was a plane that landed about 100 yards away from the house. We never left the house. Uh, the other thing that uh, I remember very vividly was that uh, when I was playing checkers with uh, the old man Driesen, they had a German shepherd who would warn us if somebody would come to the house. But next door, uh, the next house, uh, was a doctor and he had a German a servant and she would come over once in a while 
and the dog always would bark. This time the dog did not bark. So the door opened and I didn't know who it was. So I dove behind a large chair and uh, the girl walked in and she was having some coffee and some cake and I was sitting behind the chair for two hours, not moving. And uh, I don't know what would have happened if she would have seen me. You know, those are the, the memories that I have. I have many more memories when, uh, from the point that we were hidden, that we, we were liberated, I mean. Uh, during the two years that we were in hiding, uh, my dad, who was always a very strong optimist, he said, we're going to be liberated. And uh, he kept busy. He had two large maps on the wall, one from the so-called Eastern Front, where the Russians and the Germans were fighting, and one from the Western Front that was part of uh, North Africa, Italy, and all of Western Europe. And the only access we had to news what, is what the farmer showed us in the newspapers that were very pro-German, of course. And whenever we read that uh, the German army uh, successfully uh, was able to take on new defensive positions uh, at such and such a place, we had all kinds of little pins on the map. We would see that it was a, maybe 60 or 80 kilometers back and uh, of course the big fight was at that time in, uh, in uh, the end of uh, in 42 the end of 42 was uh, the battle of Stalingrad and uh, the Germans got really bloodied there and that was their uh, that's when they retreated out of Russia because they could not handle the winter they could not handle the Russian army and uh, we knew that there was a, a glimmer of hope that eventually Germany would be defeated. It was September the 17th, 1944. It was 12 o'clock noon. It was on a Sunday and uh, the sky was beautifully blue. We had a little window that we could look out and that we could see the sky. And we heard a lot of planes come over and my dad said, I think, I think that uh, this is our day because uh, little black dots came out of the plane. We didn't know what they were, uh, but we, uh, we found out that those were uh, American Airborne from the 82nd Airborne Division, the 508 Regiment. And uh, they landed about a mile up the road on top of the hill. And uh, that afternoon, uh, they sent out a patrol and a German tank was coming up from the bottom and uh, some of the Americans apparently could speak German. So uh, when the German tank came up, they were hidden in the bush about 50 yards past our house and uh, they said, Halt! Vera! which means uh, stop, who's that, in German. And uh, the German in the tank answered, don't shoot, don't shoot, Nick Schiessen. And uh, so they had a bazooka with them and they blew the, the German tank up. That was the first uh, thing of direct war that we were involved in. And uh, the Germans were very strong on the bottom of the hill. They had two regiments there. And uh, the Americans were uh, very minimal in force because they, they could not have their heavy weapons with them. And so we were caught in no man's land. We were in the middle of the hill. And <clears throat> the next day, the Germans started to evacuate all the houses around us and they started to uh, uh, turn them into, uh, they, they leveled them, they burned them down, and uh, we were maybe a little bit too far for them, and they did not uh, set our house on fire. 
we went with 12 people in the basement and uh, the first night my dad and I, uh, this was on the Monday night, uh, he said let's see if we can uh, reach the Americans and so uh, he crawled out out of the basement and he made it to a, uh, a large haystack and I was with him and this was in around 10 o'clock at night and so the Germans saw some movement and they opened fire upon the haystack and my dad and I were laying there and uh, then the Americans opened up from the other side because they didn't know who they were. They, the Germans didn't know that there were people in the house and the Americans didn't know that there were people in the house. So we were caught for five days with a no man's land. So after half an hour, we were lying flat on, the, on our bellies. My dad says, okay, let's, let's get back to the house. And so we crawled back on our bellies to the house and uh, we dove into the basement and uh, just after the basement, uh, the big 88 millimeter uh, tank shell came through the door that we were in, that we went through. And so um, we, went, we were sitting most of the time in the basement, but my sister and I, uh, on the second night, we, we could not hold it any longer. So we started to be in the living room and we looked at all the houses that were set afire by the Germans. And it was a terrible sight. And I can still see the flames. Uh, my memory is too good at that. So we spent more time in the cell, in the basement. And uh, after the fourth day, there was a patrol that came by. And uh, my older sister could speak English and she saw the top of the helmets and she was just going to say please help us when she saw that it was a German patrol and luckily she did not say anything because we could look she could look out of the basement window and uh, on the morning of uh, the 23rd of September at four o'clock an American patrol came by and uh, two men carrying a stretcher and uh, my sister uh, said SOS save our souls save our souls so they stopped and we came out of the basement and uh, we asked if the, they could take us with and they said no we can't because we have this wounded soldier here and we have to take him to the field hospital and uh, you can't go with us and they said, do you have a blanket? And uh, we got a blanket out of the house and we put it over the wounded soldier. And about 10 seconds later, they pulled the blanket over his head, which was the first person that I ever had seen die. And we knew that he was dead. And then they said, well, uh, uh, if we wouldn't have stopped, maybe the soldier would still be alive. And my sister said, please take us with, please take us with. And so they said, okay, why don't you come with us? So we had to crawl along the road through the ditch. Um, and we saw a lot of uh, dead soldiers, German soldiers lying there. And we crawled up for about a mile to the top of the hill. And uh, that's where... Uh, we were finally, we were in American hands and we felt that we were liberated, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, my sisters, uh, we were given a house uh, that was uh, occupied by a German collaborator who had fled and we were there with uh, the five of us, my parents, my two sisters and me. And we, uh, my sisters right away uh, wanted to help. Uh, they could speak a little bit of English and there was a, an American field hospital across the street and they went over there and they said, uh, can we help? And their help was greatly appreciated and they spent uh, all day there 
uh, all the days that we were there and helping. And all I did was ask for chocolate because, uh, and I learned some uh, American slang. And every evening we saw the American patrols go down the hill and in the morning they would come back, sometimes not as many people as they left. And uh, October 2nd came up, we were standing uh, outside, my dad, my oldest sister, and the two people, uh, the younger people that have kept us in hiding, they were standing against the fence. In the middle of the square were four American soldiers, and they were talking to each other, and uh, next to that were my other sister and me. And this German plane came over and dropped a fragmentation bomb, and it killed my sister instantly. Uh, it killed the two people that kept us in hiding, the two young people, and it killed the four American soldiers. And luckily, my dad and my other sister and me, we, we luckily did not get a scratch. And my sister that was killed, she had a, got a piece of shrapnel right through her heart. And she was able, after she was hit, to run into a house uh, and she collapsed in, in the basement. And 40 years later, in 1984, uh, I was at an automotive convention and I met a gentleman, his name is Peter Meyer. And um, he said, where are you from? I said, I'm from Holland. He said, so am I. Uh, where from? Well, uh, I am from Berg and Dahl. I said, well, we were in hiding about a mile down the road from where you were living. He said, I know, my mother told me there were Jews on that farm and I was never allowed to talk about it. And uh, he said, I've got a shock for you. Your sister died in our basement. You know, small world. In 1985, I was playing golf with a gentleman, his name is Hank Lefever. He said, you have a funny accent, where are you from? I said, I'm from Holland. He said, well, I fought in Holland. I said, where? He said, uh, we dropped near Nijmegen, near Beek. And I said, are you from the 82nd Airborne? He said, yes. I said, where did you drop? He said, it was called the hill. I said, it was about half a mile from where I was in hiding. And you Americans liberated us. He said, well, he said, you have to do me a big favor. When we have our annual uh, convention of the 82nd Airborne, we would like you to be our guest because we would like to show you to our sons and daughters and wives that what we fought for is people like you. And uh, he said, would you like to, to be present? I said, of course. He said, how many people are in your family? I said, well, I have uh, my wife and three children. He said, I'll send you five tickets. So a week before, he called and he said, Bert, would you like to be our speaker? I said, well, I'm not a good speaker. The only time I, I talk is when I have my three children around me and they never listen. He said, you have to be our speaker. And so he said, prepare yourself for uh, what happened during your hiding time, how you were liberated, how you got there, etc., etc. So I made a speech and uh, my wife added it. It was about first 15 minutes long, which is way too long. So I could cut it down to eight minutes. And I was telling everybody what happened and how we were uh, hidden in a farm with a flat roof. And so at the end of the speech, this man comes forward. His name is Bob Niblos. He said, I'm the one who uh, brought the, the wounded soldier to your farm and you know, uh, your family went with us to uh, Bergendal. You know, it's a small world, isn't it? So...
I think it's most important that history does not repeat itself, that we learn from the past, that we learn to be uh, more tolerant, more uh, understanding of other people, uh, that we teach people that are civilized to act like civilized people. Animals don't do things what the Germans did to the Jews and to the gypsies and to other people that were mentally retarded because Hitler wanted all of them to be gone. What did we do? We were normal people. Uh, we have five fingers on each hand. Uh, we, were, we grew up in, in a German society. We were not in ghettos. Uh, we were more German than Jews. Uh, we, we were totally uh, flabbergasted that what happened to us. And uh, the big lesson is that people have to learn tolerance, understanding, and being able to accept each other as human beings and not put themselves in a box of, I'm a German, I'm an American. We're all human beings. And the main thing that we have to do is to keep this story alive for the simple reason that we have to learn from it.